Today is the second day of our Young Innovators uh, Week Brazil 2022. Uh, for the speakers that uh, have arri arrived today for the program from today, uh, a, a short introduction. So this is a, 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 an, a program uh, to present to the young innovators from Germany and Brazil uh, the, the innovation ecosystem in Brazil. In Brazil, uh, aiming that they plan Brazil in their internationalization uh, plans uh, for their startups. We have also uh, both from Germany and from Brazil uh, young people. They are undergraduate students or PhD students from Germany. We have Thomas. Thomas is already a research, a younger research with a research position, uh, and uh, they all want to, be, to be an entrepreneur. Well, some of them are in the idea phase, and uh, other ones are starting their startups. Okay, so we have a very broad uh, spectrum uh, of public. And yes, I, today, so the part of the pro, yesterday we present uh, Brazil, Brazil and Germany relationship, and so on. And today we we and, and we talk with representatives from big companies from Brazil and from Germany. So Natura, Melhoramentos, uh, SAP, and the last one and Braskem and uh, the startup Fluke uh, from, from OSP. So it was a very interesting program yesterday uh, in the afternoon as well. So today is the part of what uh, Catalani will present, introduce the ecosystem uh, for innovation in Brazil, entrepreneurship. And after that, we will present you some examples of uh, very important actors in this area, uh, institutions that make uh, applied research uh, linking scientific uh, knowledge with uh, implementation application in agriculture, in industry, uh, and so on, and life science, as, and so on. Um, then, later in the morning, we will have uh, intercultural training, and after that, we will have lunch. So, our speakers are all invited as well uh, for lunch, um, yes, at uh, 12.30. Okay, our first speaker is uh, Professor Luis Catalani, that you have already uh, known uh, yesterday here by his greetings. Uh, I will not read all the text. So, Catalani, uh, I will uh, present so very uh, spontaneous. He is professor for chemistry, and he uh, currently is director here from the Innovation Agency uh, of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he is a DAD alumnus, uh, and uh, he was already a member uh, of our jury of Falling Walls Lab that we will present tomorrow for, uh, to you. Okay, uh, I think that's enough to present to Catalani, a uh, big partner, good partner here at OSB. Thank you very much, Mark. You're collecting the sound today, did you? No? Okay, so I'll just speak to Mike. Thank you. No, no, Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, I hope you have had yesterday a nice day. And uh, 
My most welcome to my colleagues from uh, the speakers today. Uh, very nice to have you here. And I hope, uh, I, I cannot stay longer with you today, but I hope you will complete my talk today here. I had the task, a double task, to present the innovation system, the Brazilian innovation system, and then uh, the, the uh, ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem of the University of Sao Paulo. So I, I try to uh, get some information. Of course, Brazil innovation system is a very complex, and, uh, and Brazil is a big country. I, I try to, to get some, no, no, yes. So I don't know if you, yesterday you had some introduction about the size of Brazil, the numbers of Brazil. I will just give you some very quick facts. Brazil is a federation of 26 states and uh, we're very large in land. We're the fifth largest in land in, in the world and we are the sixth largest in population. We used to be seventh global economy. Now, in the last uh, few uh, decades, we've been going down, and now we are the ninth global economy, or we're still very big. We are the biggest consumer market in Latin America. In spite of that, we are still a very heterogeneous country with a lot of social inequalities. And with that said, you see that our ecosystem has some difference depending on the state you are. That's why I put this. Uh, okay, so I will start with this, the shadows here, this uh, six uh, most, uh, let's say, uh, different groups that are uh, uh, part of our, our innovation maps. And uh, in the center, we are here, university, uh, and what we call ICTs, which are the institutions of science, technology, and innovation. Uh, uh, this group is where the science is uh, provided for the market, universities in the center, but we still have some public uh, R&D institutions, private R&D institutions. As the university system, we, are, we have uh, in three different levels, federal university, state university, and city university. City universities are very few. I didn't even uh, list them. They are very few. Most common are federal universities. Every state has at least one federal university. Most states have more than one, right? So that makes a big system of federal universities. Uh, we have a listed 42 state universities, state, every state, or at least most of the states. They also try to organize uh, uh, public um, education and science system within their state uh, universities. And then we have uh, about 100 private universities. So that makes uh, like uh, two 200 universities in Brazil. Uh, half of this, uh, they are devoted to, at least half of this is uh, really devoted to science and technology, right? And by law, all of these STIs, they should have an authority in technological and innovation that us. Uh, our SPIN is the, the authority uh, within the University of Sao Paulo, and you see some of the other uh, uh, examples here today of different universities, right? Uh, as for the R&D institution, oops, okay. 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 As the R&D institutions, uh, there are some uh, big institutions here. Uh, Butantan Institute is a biopharma type of uh, uh, R&D institution. It's a state uh, uh, driven here, but we still have uh, Fiocruz. It's also biopharma. I think Fiocruz is here with us today. Uh, you. I don't have to speak about Frio Cruz. And Brapa is another one big system with more than uh, 40 units of Embrapa. I think Embrapa will be here with us today. Already coming. Ah, coming. Embrapa is coming. <laughs> and, but uh, there are other uh, types of uh, 
uh, STIs, like our Singleton Facility in Campinas, uh, IMPA is a math devoted institution and our space agency and so forth and so forth. So uh, those are the public R&D the institution. They are either uh, financed by the Federation, by, by the central uh, government or state uh, financed like Putin, for instance, right? Uh, why? Okay. Uh, the role of government are many. Uh, let's start by, of course, we have uh, uh, the innovation uh, is uh, organized in three different levels. We have a ministry uh, of science, technology, innovation. In every state, there are a secretariat that is devoted to uh, innovation. And we have municipal uh, uh, secretary of innovation, most of the cities. Uh, the, the, the regulation in Brazil is that uh, treats innovation is somewhat uh, young. Uh, our uh, regulatory mark, uh, to give you an idea, the, 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 the last, uh, let's say, quality jump we had in, in law, in, in regulation innovation, is from 2016. And uh, last year we had our... Uh, regulation mark on startups is from last year, 21. So we are still really digesting this whole new uh, approach, this no, whole new uh, 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 possibilities that this, the lawmakers put in these laws, but uh, our, our courts are still not really, uh, uh, let's say, we still haven't had the opportunity to put everything in place and working. So every one of us are working on how to uh, 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 make this, this law uh, usual to everyone. Uh, okay, let's not, uh, uh, in terms of funding, the major players here are the Brazilian Development Bank. We still have uh, a a, a large amount of mo money coming directly to this BNDS. And then we have a couple of other uh, uh, players here. The National Fund for Scientific and Technological Innovation, NGCT, is a, it's a, it's a fund, a sectorial fund for sectors. And they provide 16, or uh, depends on where you look, it's 14 to 16 different sectors that by law, provide funds from to innovation and technology development. So this is a kind of uh, a tax uh, uh, reduction or, or tax uh, uh, afforded to these funds. And uh, they have the different ways of using these funds. Uh, uh, FINEP, this player here, this is the National Project Funding Agency. That's the one that operates the national funds. And so the companies, they can reach out for this fund in different ways, depending on what uh, FINEP is. Uh, there, there are at least three major ways to, to uh, uh, get these funds. Uh, uh, but depending on the funds also, the company itself uh, can use the, 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 the tax that it has to pay to uh, direct uh, into uh, innovation. Most important is that these funds, they have to use one of the STIs to, re to, to be partnered to, to this uh, uh, science development. So and this could be private STIs, but most of the time are the public STIs. Uh, and then we have a, a, a side here is the education that uh, provides support to uh, uh, PhD and master through fellowships. Uh, those are two big uh, 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 foundations here, federal foundations that give these uh, fellowships. Okay, and then there is the uh, state research foundations. Most of these states, at least the, 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 the ones that have uh, some 
uh, uh, capacity to invest in science. They have uh, a, a state foundation. In Sao Paulo, we have a PESP, the, state, so, uh, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. This is, a, this is really a, 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 the, the, the most uh, efficient uh, drive into uh, innovation and technology and science that we have uh, in, in our system. So the FAP has played a really important uh, role in the whole, in the whole system. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Embrapi a little bit later. And that's a, a very special uh, uh, fund that we have here to provide companies to invest in innovation. Uh, as the companies, right? Okay, as I said, the big companies, they, they can reach out money from the, the sectorial funds through the use of the FNDCT, either uh, through calls from FINEPI, or they can, depending on the type of the funds, they can use uh, the, the, the regulatory agents to uh, approve the use of their own money that they would use to pay tax, they would uh, divert this money to uh, uh, science and technology. So as you can see here, we have uh, uh, 16 sectorial funds. Uh, some of them are uh, multi-task, like the green yellow fund, but most of them are a very narrow uh, uh, in, in, in a thematic uh, uh, driven type of uh, uh, action, right? Uh, the, the, the companies also can use Embrapi. Embrapi is a system that is in place, uh, uh, how old is Embrapi? 10 years, maybe a little longer? 12 years? 15 minutes, okay. Thank eight. you. Huh? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So in eight years, Embrapi uh, has uh, worked in a, in a very, uh, let's say, innovative way. Uh, the uh, Embrapi got funded by the government, and it, it uh, contracts with a, a company for each dollar the company puts in, in some projects. Embrapi puts another dollar, and the STI would put one or more dollars in infrastructure and are uh, and, and uh, human resources so this makes this kind of system very efficient this is growing very fast it's becoming one of the most important ways to de to develop innovation to develop technology in brazil i think about it now has more than 30 units spread out in, in every corner of Brazil. And the, the habitat systems, uh, we have incubators from every STI has one incubator uh, and eventually a, a, a tech park. And uh, we have this S system which uh, 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 services that uh, also from different uh, 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 sectors of the economy. They organize in this kind of a system. And some of them, the Brazilian uh, Sebrae will be here, I guess, or Senai? Uh, Senai. Senai. Senai will be here? Senai. And, and Sebrae, and they will show you how this works. So this S system is organized by these, these big sectors and they provide also input into the innovation system. And then we have uh, what, what I put the best uh, uh, translation I could is the trade, trade guilds, which are the federations. So we have uh, federal, in, in federal levels like Unpay, like the CNI, Industry National Confederation, and CNI has one branch, which is the MEI, the Business Mobilization for Innovation, so all of this uh, works very active, uh, actively in terms of 10 minutes. Whoa, it's going very fast. 
uh, uh, towards uh, uh, innovation activities. Uh, so, and so, in terms of relations, the, the startups, companies, they usually come to incubators. The uh, uh, SITs are the, maize, the most uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, initiators of uh, startups, but they also would come from companies. Depending on the funds you get, you, you can uh, 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 induce the formation of the startups. The, the venture capitals, of course, they would be very related to incubators and tech park. So, uh, and the, the trade guilds are, of course, they are run by companies and they try to influence the system that comes to incubators. But also the trade guilds, they influence a lot the funding on that. So the companies have a lot of power in terms of directing the innovation systems in Brazil through, through this. Uh, uh, way, but I must say, I see, as I see, the the triple electors in Brazil are well established at this moment. We are in a very turning point, and I think the future of this country in terms of uh, innovation is already uh, well established. So we just need to uh, continue growing in every direction, as you see uh, in this meeting many examples. Let's talk about uh, USP. We are in Sao Paulo state. We are the uh, most uh, uh, efficient state in terms of uh, GDP. We are one third of the whole Brazilian GDP. It's a very innovative economy. We are the third biggest consumer market in Latin America, where Brazil is the first, and then Argentina, and then Sao Paulo. If economy position, we will be the 21st one in the world, bigger than Argentina, Brazil, and, and Belgium, and Chile. So we have uh, <coughs> three sister state universities here. The only country will be you will be heard about the country. I don't think so. Unesco will be here, but the only country is here. Uh, let's talk about Sao Paulo University. We we have uh, 80 years, very young university. Uh, uh, 56 schools in six different countries. We are over now. We are over 100,000 students. If you if you put uh, also uh, uh, everything together, but we have 60,000 undergrads and 30,000 uh, uh, grad students. Almost 6,000 professors and researchers working here. We are a world class university. Usually, the, uh, we, we get the best uh, uh, ranking in, in, in most ranks. We are the best university in Latin America. Uh, uh, as you can see here, we are top uh, two, three in the top 200 in the uh, Times Higher Education. And all of these ranks, we are very well uh, ranked in, as, as one of the, the best universities in, in the country. Uh, I have to run. Okay, innovation in 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 our university is run by one prorector. It's the dean of the research and innovation. It's very new. We we didn't have a dean in innovation this year. Uh, the this uh, dean of uh, research became dean of research and innovation, and we have two major players: uh, the agents, which is me and in Alva USP, which is the innovation center. That's, uh, let's say, we are the authority of innovation, and in Alva USP is the executive center of innovation in the University of Sao Paulo. This building, for instance, is the center of innovation. OK, as for everyone's role here, uh, the dean of the university gets to be uh, 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 in contact with, with every one of the, these uh, unities within the, the university. Alspin is the authority, and innovation makes the role of the front end, uh, the contact with uh, all the sectors inside and outside the university. Uh, 
We have uh, f five incubators and two technological parks. We have a technological park at Supera and one at the Zalf, and every one of them is a uh, it's, uh, different incubator in different campus. The idea is to have one incubator in every campus. We have uh, two major think tanks on innovation, and as, as uh, projects devoted to innovation, we have uh, many examples. I'll put my, my, my effort in, in describing, for instance, we have seven MVP <coughs> units in biotechnological processes, in materials for, 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 uh, for uh, construction, uh, powertrain, technogreen, biophotonics, and we have these two new ones. Uh, last year we got uh, two new uh, uh, of these unities in drug development. So we are in, in the map. Our spin is the tech transfer and IP office. Of course, we have to have offices in most of these campuses. The, uh, incubators, we have one in Piracicaba, Super is here, uh, Abitz is in Sao Paulo, uh, the east side, and Cetec is the one that we have here in this campus. And in Nova USP, we have at least four now, and uh, two more being created, four centers, Lorena, Sao Paulo, uh, São Carlos, and Ribeirão Preto. Oops. Uh, our number, we are the second best Brazilian entrepreneurial university uh, through this ranking the, uh, in Brazil. Uh, the three first editions, we were the, the first one, and last year we lost to Unicamp. I uh, worked a little bit more last year. <laughs> sure, but we are very proud that uh, Unicamp got the first, and uh, we are head to head with them, and uh, we are very good partners. And, uh, uh, that's a very nice competition between the University of Camp, uh, in Campinas and, and very healthy. It's not a, this kind of a, so uh, we are very close. Uh, São Paulo State is very, very good state for innovation. Uh, our numbers is still running. You can see here that uh, uh, we have uh, about 800 IP requests in the past seven years. Median uh, number is 80 new IPs per year in our university. Uh, you see the numbers of uh, Fiocruz and uh, Anunicampi. Um, uh, we have a collection. We, we try to collect now. This is uh, the uh, one project we have here. Try to collect the companies in Brazil that has the DNA USB. And this was a, a, a collection uh, of two years we have now uh, two, uh, over uh, 2,000 uh, companies that has either born in, in, in USP or born from some uh, USP uh, researcher. Uh, uh, we have uh, almost 600 incubated uh, uh, startups in our history, not, not uh, at this moment but it has been uh, incubated in our system. Uh, we try to get this number, it's something that is really hard to get, but uh, we, we are, uh, in terms of revenues, all these DNA companies uh, together uh, produce over 15 billion uh, US dollars in revenue. This is a kind of a number that is very impressive and we are trying to, to get this number correctly. And this is a very crude provision. Brazil has today 20, 21 unicorns. Uh, to give you an idea, out of these 21, seven were born at USP, right? And uh, in our accounting, two out of three founders studied at USP. And uh, this is the most recent number. Within these uh, uh, 21 unicorns, we found uh, 2,500 alumni from USP in Bright. So I guess this put us uh, uh, USP as a very innovative, very entrepreneur uh, university. I think this number speak to by themselves, right? 
this is the this is the sampling of the companies that has the DNA USP, right? Those are the incubator, incubated, and then this half size is direct to to market. And uh, with that, I give you a very crude map of what Brazil is in innovation and what uh, uh, the rest of Sao Paulo is in, in terms. And we are really ready to cooperate with anyone from any country. Uh, I step very quickly. Uh, we, we have uh, 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 connections to more than um, uh, two, 2,000 universities throughout the world. And uh, so we, we, can, we have connections with uh, uh, more than 200 or more than 100. Uh, the number of countries that we have connections almost every uh, corner of this world, the uh, University of Southern Paul has some kind of connection. So with that, I thank you. And this is my, my email. If you want to speak at any time, please okay. take a note. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was an uh, incredible uh, work, that uh, job that you have done here for us. Uh, I, I, I have forgot to, to to ask you about your time. Have your time. You have no, class. I, I, I need to teach at ten o'clock. So okay. I, yes, I need to, to leave. Uh, uh, five yeah, I have five minutes to get to the. Uh, so no, no time for questions then. But I'll be back. Uh, if you guys from the, I have my colleagues here. They they will. Of course, can answer most of uh, the crude ideas I put here. They will okay. try to help you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. So then uh, we go to the next one. So I, I want to inform that uh, we have, meanwhile, uh, our speaker team completed. So all of them uh, have already uh, arrived. So fine, thank you very much for, for coming. So the next speaker is José Luiz Guimarães. Uh, he is the head of the of CETEC, the incubator, tech incubator from USP, the University of USP and IPEN. This is the Institute for uh, Research on Nuclear Energy. Uh, but uh, the Institute of Research, uh, a broader area. So, and uh, Luizio is entrepreneur with communication and social science background and have more than 10, 20 years experience uh, in innovation hubs at the Innovation Entrepreneurship and Technology Center. Uh, and yeah, here is uh, Luizio. Thank you for coming, Luizio. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, after this presentation of the whole innovation system in, in Brazil, I'm going to speak about one tiny piece on this machinery, that is the CETEC, the incubator center here at the campus in Sao Paulo. So uh, our aim is to build an environment for converting technologies into business. So, we have been doing this for the last 25 years. We started with three companies, and then we go for seven companies, and then we had more than 700 companies if we, in our portfolio. Uh, among them, 180 companies, 18, 80 companies have graduated. It means they uh, completed the development uh, they have first applied uh, on their on their beginning at the incubator where uh, actually we started as a classic incubator with uh, a, a classic uh, 
processes. But uh, today we have pre-COVID, we had uh, like 100 companies incubated uh, along the year with like 30, year, 30 companies uh, changing uh, during the year. Now we have like 80 companies. So our ecosystem is very privileged. As Catalina told you, uh, we are in this campus, which is very rich in uh, research and development. And that's why most of the companies in, in our uh, facility are hard tech companies. So we are a technology-based uh, incubator, and we have hard sciences uh, researchers beginning uh, to be entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a very hard path to do because they have to change their mindset, they have to change their KPIs, their metrics. Uh, so as I say, it's not about publishing their, their ideas, it's, um, it's about factory, going to bills. That's what, that's a very, that's a very hard drive uh, to change their mindset. So the incubator itself, it's like 86 uh, modules and the companies are uh, actually established uh, inside the, 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 the building. It's a, it's a professional building. It was not built for an incubator. We have to adapt it all along the, 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 the way uh, to fit this, all these companies uh, during this period. Uh, we've built a framework of incubation. It's a very classic kind of, uh, of framework of, of incubation with uh, ideal duration of 3.5 years. But as a hard science facility, we have some companies that are staying with us for a more uh, extended uh, time, like up to nine years. So the first, the first years they are in the ideation process, and then they go to building the MVP, and then market uh, validation, and then we have to build the teamwork, the, the, the stakeholders, the company strategy, and then uh, establishing the growth path of the companies. Uh, this is the classic incubation modalities. Uh, it's not usual to have post-incubation. Uh, uh, we are one of the single facilities that have post-incubation process. So after the uh, graduation, the, the company can still be with us for more three or four years. It's very important for the companies because they are still uh, very innovative. They're still dealing with the university and uh, they are already on the market. It means that we have some companies that are already on the growth process. Uh, currently, we are a health tech. 50 of our companies are health tech. It was not a, a decision. It just came for us. Which it's not a, a, strate a strategic uh, definition. We just like, uh, it's, it's mostly because of the, the, the technological centers in the university. Uh, last year, we have 80 83 million reais uh, of net income from the companies, which is a very huge number. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little rushy because I think that the cases are the best thing to show. So this one, MagnaMed, is one of the most important companies that we have in our, in our facility. Uh, during the, the COVID uh, effort, they had these pulmonary ventilators that were very important to, to the country, and they, are, they sell it, in, uh, including outside the country. It's a very important uh, uh, to have this kind of technology inside. And they, they had all the journey of the entrepreneur in our facility. They went with an idea, 
they accessed the funding with FAPESP and FINEPI, and then they were uh, invested by the first uh, 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 venture fund in Brazil that was Criatec, and they, now they are selling their, their products all around the world. Tissue Labs is a raising star now. They are on the path to build the 3D printing for the heart. They're looking with stem cells. So they take the stem cell and they build a, a bioprint organs. And they, they, these guys, they are, are in an acceleration process in Switzerland now. And they have the two units, both for the supplies and the 3D printing. Axmobot, it's a, it's a drone, an armored vehicles. In this case, they produce both the avionics and the IT system that can help uh, the agribusiness, the security and defense, traffic and logistics. It's a very huge success now, both in terms of technology and also in terms of business. They are very aggressive in acquiring other companies and in getting invested in, in being uh, the, the Latin America hot shop. Um, now it has this, it's a data analysis company. They acquire public data and cross-reference and they offer it for the market. For example, some of the major uh, unicorns uh, in Brazil, they acquire their API data so they can use it on their uh, decision-making process. And also government, public government can, public uh, entities can use their data to make better decision, decisions. This is a, uh, just got into our portfolio. It's another example, a drug de delivery for oncology. They take the Zika virus and they change the Zika virus so they can drug delivery in the brain cells for treating oncology, uh, for treating cancer without uh, the need of surgery. Very, very high tech uh, experience. So this is our infrastructure. We have uh, here at the campus of EPN. And, and then we have the second uh, infrastructure that we are aiming to build a, a, a life science and net zero innovation lab. Some of the entities that are here have known about this because we want to build a, a, a global, a global uh, standard kind of entity that is actually uh, managed by CETEC. So, pretty much it. I've made it in 10, 10 minutes, so that's it. Okay, I have some more. So that's it, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aloysio. So at the end of the presentation, we will have here uh, the question and answer session. So this, uh, uh, to remember this first uh, panel is about, uh, is, uh, we, are, we are presenting actors from universities, uh, from state uh, initiatives. Uh, in the second part, we will have uh, sectorial, uh, sectorial uh, examples. Uh, so the next one is then uh, Vanessa uh, Sensato. She will present you Innovation Agency of the State University of Campinas. Uh, Vanessa, she is the director of institutional relations, and she is already uh, a long, long partner from the VH. She was. Uh, in the last two editions of our Polymorphs Lab, she was uh, offering a pitch training for the candidates, for the finalists, for our uh, Brazilian uh, classification qualification. Uh, 
Vanessa, as me, uh, has a, a major in social communication and uh, a master in science and technology policy. And uh, is also a DAD alumna. Uh, so she has uh, experience in Germany as well, good uh, background. So um, if you're ready, you can start. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming, Thank you. Thank you, Marcio. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Vanessa. I'm currently Director for Institutional Relations at Unicamp. It's such a pleasure to be here at uh, USP and also to be, uh, I guess, the only woman in the panel, so to represent the women. Oh, and uh, Caroline is also great to represent the yes. women and, uh, and uh, in entrepreneurship and innovation. I've been in this business for around 16 years right now. And I was in Hamburg right before coming back to Brazil. So uh, I know how it is to be in another country and then to come here. Well, um, the University of Campinas uh, has um, has a, a, its major campus in the city of Campinas, that is a city that is located around 100 kilometers from here. Just for you to get to know a little bit, it's quite similar with the relation from London to Cambridge. We like very much to make this comparison because uh, we have been part of us at the Innovation Agency of Unicamp trained in Cambridge. So it's very similar, it's a city of around 1.2 million inhabitants, right? So it's not a very large city, but it's a large city close to Sao Paulo, which uh, uh, gives us uh, the benefit of being uh, quite uh, close to Sao Paulo and also not to have all the traffic and so on. I quite like living there. Uh, about Unicamp, we are a state university, as Professor Catalani mentioned, right? We are very young, so uh, created in 1966, uh, a university that is tuition free, right? And we have around 40,000 students. Half of those are grad students. So as we have around 20,000 students in uh, grad studies, we are very strong in research and uh, uh, very strong as well in establishing some area to take care of innovation and entrepreneurship. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Unicamp started thinking about this, I guess, in the 70s. We have our first patents in the 80s. In, 90, in the 90s, we already had a tech transfer office. And in the year 2001, we had the incubator, uh, the, the, the technology-based incubator established. And then in 2003, uh, we gathered those areas into the Agency of Innovation. We call it INNOVA, right? It's INNOVA Unicamp Innovation Agency. Currently, we have a model that's a little bit different from other uh, universities because we gather the management of most of the structures related to innovation and entrepreneurship in the university. So, for example, um, currently we are responsible for IP protection, so intellectual property, tech transfer, uh, the research contracts with companies. So, of course, we help when we're working with USP or Fiocruz that you're going to talk to, but um, it's our responsibility to establish the research contracts with industry. We're also responsible for the management of the incubator and the science park. Right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the science park. So if you have, um, if you are interested at a certain point to visit or to have more information, we can give them to you later on. We're also responsible for the promotion of the culture of entrepreneurship and uh, the contact with alumni companies. I'll tell you a little bit. This is really an asset to have uh, the contact with the alumni companies because we create a circle that is very positive, right? Uh, all of the areas work together in, um, and we believe this is very positive 
because we have some incubated companies with tech transfer projects, with R&D uh, projects, or startups at our science park that uh, do research together with us and contact with large companies. So we believe this structure is a very positive structure to establish new projects and, to, uh, and for the innovation cycle itself. We have currently a portfolio of uh, uh, 1,200, over 1,200 uh, patents, right? Uh, um, recently, we have been filing around 50 a year, and last year we had 20, 129 granted. So, um, and of course, if we do patents, is for transferring this to the market. So we're all the time, or finding students to start new businesses with those patents, or transferring those to large, well-established companies, right? Last year, we signed 30 licensing contracts. Oh, and 86 uh, R&D contracts with companies. We have all sorts of R&D contracts for those with companies. We work with companies of all sizes. What we say is that it is very important that they have an innovation DNA. So. Sometimes, of course, in a country like Brazil, we have companies that are not very much uh, innovative or don't know how to do R&D. Those companies are hard to work with because most of our technologies are embryonic and we need, we need uh, entrepreneurs that understand how it is to start a, uh, uh, a innovative business with embryonic companies, right? So we have... Uh, uh, partnerships with companies as Samsung that are huge, or smaller companies, for example, as Hubox or Agricef or as Cosmeticos do Bem, that is one of our spin off companies. What are the benefits for a startup or a spin out company to work with us? First, we give lots of visibility. We understand that when you are starting a new business, it's very good to have a last name. Right, so we can provide companies with vis visibility within the media, with vi visibility within the, uh, the ecosystem itself. So that's something we do, and that's something uh, we believe it's important for starting businesses. We have contact with all sorts of investors. They do come to Unicamp to understand what companies we're working with. So this is for us a must and we're all the time uh, presenting new investors to our new established companies, and so it goes. Uh, and of course, the contact with innovation, with the innovation ecosystem, as Professor Catalani said, we're very close, we work together, and uh, you know, when we need, uh, a company needs some sort of contact, we're there for them. And of course, when the company is established inside Unicamp, or has a relationship with Unicamp, uh, they have access to talents and the infrastructure of the university. Uh, we understand for any, uh, that for any kind of business, to have access, access to great talents is something that it's very important, and we're one of the uh, most important universities uh, at uh, South America, so Latin America, so we understand that uh, that is important. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our science park. As I said, it's managed by us. We have an area of 300 and, uh, 350,000 square meters inside the campus of Campinas, that is around 100 kilometers from here. 100,000 is urbanized. So we have a very large green area, and I guess at least 100,000 uh, square meters will be green area forever. <laughs> so it's a very uh, positive and uh, good location. Uh, we have in the Science Park mostly uh, incubated, start incubated companies, startups, and uh, companies with R&D with Unicamp. As I said, for example, Samsung is one of them and IBM as well. So we have large companies that are in the same building with the startups and with the incubated companies. Uh, currently, we have six, uh, six buildings, they are those, right? And over 40 companies there. 
over 700 uh, jobs. And of course, we have a very strong DNA on research. So over 500 uh, jobs are focused on research and development. Uh, from the 41, uh, nine R&D labs, 15 are startups and 17 are incubated companies. I'm going to talk a little bit about our incubation program. Uh, it is uh, as similar as CTX, a 36 week uh, incubation program. We have a uh, first semester generally dedicated to pre incubation, right? And then uh, uh, we go working on, to, uh, on the entrepreneur, the technology, access to capital and market and management around 436. We don't have a post incubation program as you do. Later on, we should talk about it. <laughs> um, these are some of the investors and accelerators we work with. We are very worried about building the main connections for our companies. So um, sometimes they are not here, but we do have contact with so this is important that after the incubation program, or if you are in a startup, a startup uh, in our um, in our uh, science and technology park, we can uh, make this connection for you. Uh, the last part of it, uh, I told you about the importance of the connection with our alumni companies. We have currently uh, over a thousand alumni companies. Right, uh, over a thousand that are active haven't been sold, and among them, uh, we have large companies as CINT and Mo the Mobile Group that just purchased that purchased in the past iFood, and we have smaller companies that are spin out or spin off companies, startups. So. This group is very important in the sense that we can use the experience <coughs> of the most the experience of the larger companies to help build the new businesses. And we're all the time working together so that uh, younger entrepreneurs have access and opportunity to, uh, to talk to an older entrepreneur, a more experienced one. And so uh, shortcuts here are very, uh, very uh, desirable. Uh, all of our uh, results are in our annual reports. I'm currently translating the last one, so uh, we still don't have it in English, but we'll have it in the next weeks. And that's it. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Vanessa. So closing this first uh, panel about... Uh, this uh, regional initiatives, we have uh, Alessandro Valerio. Alessandro is uh, head of innovation and new ventures at PECTEC. Uh, PECTEC uh, is the technological park in the city of São José dos Campos, also uh, one and a half hour uh, from Sao Paulo. And uh, Alessandro will present yourself, talk about it. It's a, 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 so a hub that is developing very, very well and fast in the last two years. Thank you very much for coming, Alessandro. Good morning for everyone. Well, good morning for everyone. I will try to explain something about the PICATEC, a technological park of São José dos Campos. São José dos Campos is a city that is something like 90 kilometers. Oh, well, it's working. Good.
Great. Located in a city having R&D and innovation in its DNA, the San Jose Los Campos Technology Park is the bridge that connects us to the future. Today, 145 companies are based within the park. Over 2,000 jobs have been generated. More than 2.7 billion reais in investments already made. A huge complex. The Technology Park is an advocate for governments, universities, companies, and society at large. The close link between sectors allows market demands to be anticipated, thus keeping companies competitive and sustainable. This convergence creates new opportunities. Programs such as the Business Office and the Projects Office seek to promote strategic partnerships and social entrepreneurship. The Entrepreneurial Galleries offer support to small entrepreneurs to transform ideas into practical solutions and concrete business opportunities. Cooperation agreements with international institutions, as well as management of the aerospace, communications, and information technology clusters, opens the doors to the world for resident and associate companies, and the doors to Brazil for foreign businesses. Nexus is our innovation hub, which accompanies entrepreneurs from conception all the way to consolidation of startups. But it's not just this. Nexus accompanies and connects small, mid-sized, and large companies, investors, and educational institutions. And a lot more is to come. Real estate projects are under full development in a dedicated area of the technology park. Relying on a modern urban infrastructure and the technology park in its center, the region is already prepared for a disruptive future. Great, it's a huge space. And it's amazing work there because we have uh, a good relation with uh, a lot of kinds of company, a lot of kinds of areas. No problems? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, this is the area of Technological Park. Over here, we have uh, Unif Unifespi, Universe, uh, Federal University of Sao Paulo. Over here, we have FATEC, uh, Technological uh, university, AKR is a uh, aero industry in Parker, it's American industry. Uh, this one have the P uh, RG research innovation RGI inside the the Tech. Okay, this is very uh, uh, near of Sao Paulo, we have more than seven, seven, seven uh, thousand people uh, around the, uh, uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure of uh, the Tech. Uh, it's a lot of kinds of company and university also. We are, uh, Tech Tech is a program from uh, the government. No, it's okay. Uh, it's a public uh, space, but coordinator and managing for a, a private uh, institu institution. And because of that, we have programs to uh, coordinate the, uh, uh, the picket tech. How we do? Uh, Immobiliar business labs are five labs, uh, cities uh, uh, development uh, technology center. Colmeia is a program from university, and we have connection with eight, to eight university. One of them is ITA. Uh, internationalization, uh, entrepreneur, 
uh, business uh, uh, ops competitive uh, with uh, IR cluster and TIC and Nexus, which is the hub uh, of innovation of Big Tech. Well, the hub, the Nexus, is uh, the connection with all the companies uh, inside the park. Uh, the companies which stay inside the park. There are uh, other programs that connect the, uh, the companies that don't stay in the park. In Nexus, we have programs to connect these ones. Nexus Lab is the program for who wants to uh, uh, create a company. It's the first steps for, for them. Students, entrepreneurs, entrepreneur. Uh, Nexus Growth Digital and Nexus Growth Tech is one step after. Uh, then for who want to grow, develop a new, uh, uh, develop business models. And this one, Nexus Growth Tech, is for uh, deep tech and hard tech. Next to scale is for companies that can scale uh, your idea, scale your companies. Next PDA, PDI is research, development, and innovation is for great companies that want to stay in the, te the technology park. Next is base is for universities. It's a kind of program for is is kind is kind of uh, uh, companies. There are other programs for uh, connection with who don't stay inside the park. Nexus Corp for corporate program, and Nexus Universities for uh, a sub program, uh, pro, uh, special program for university, for university. Um, Ciatec and Unicamp uh, show uh, uh, their programs. Nexus, there are uh, uh, very similar. It's a, uh, Way to grow. Nexus base is the first step. Nexus growth is the second step. And there are, uh, how to say it in English? That valley. That valley. Yeah. It's like how to, uh, uh, we can cross this, that valley. We have uh, 25 connections with venture capital uh, groups. Um, Connection, uh, what we offer is it the same than other ones. Connections, training, uh, facilities, are a lot of things we try to do for uh, a company's great uh, growth. Some kind of some results. 64 companies uh, graduated in Nexus, and some of them stay there. More than 98 millions of uh, revenues. 100, 137 uh, startups are subscribing in another call. We have uh, not one of vertical, we have a lot of kinds of vertical. We work with uh, all kinds of business. We try to give the knowledge, the knowledge of business and not of technology. A number of this kind of vertical, 21 in health tech. It's great to connect with Nestlé, give up some example of what we do with Nestlé. The cities, uh, um, the innovation center of Nestlé stay in the technological park. And how we give value for this? A program with matchmaking, give some our companies for them for uh, uh, solve some problems for, for Nestle. Some picture of this space. Co-working uh, in one of the space for startups. There are space for it, for, for uh, huge companies. And who is this? Thank you. Much. Actually, you can take place here. I have to invite Vanessa and uh, Aluisa as well for our talk here. Um, <laughs> so, 
So unfortunately, we have uh, at the moment only one microphone uh, <laughs> operating. Uh, but, uh, it will work, so that's all. So I want uh, to open uh, questions uh, for the public who wants uh, to be the, the first one. Uh, so uh, Catalani could not stay, as you know. Uh, but uh, I think uh, if you have other questions about the ecosystem, Brazilian ecosystem, you can ask us, we can try to, to answer them, our colleagues here in the audience as well. So uh, stay free to, to ask. Who wants to start? Rafael. <laughs> uh, thank you. One, two, three, one, two, three. Uh, yes, it's not working. Ele também desligou. Não se liga, não se liga. Agora você nem entendeu. Mas eu acho que dá para ouvir. Ok, fazer sem. Mas é que você tem a gravação do vídeo. Foi. Vai dar um pouco de ruído. Como é que dá tudo certo? Vai, vamos lá. Vamos começar, então. Ok, my question is a simple question. Because you, you told that uh, we have Unicamp, so, uh, you have Nexus, but they are not placed here in Sao Paulo. And like you, you uh, seeing a point of view of the Germans, most of them will be in the Germany, and I'm not so near Unicamp or Nexus. So can be the incubation process be done online? Yeah, 100% online. In our case, we don't have an online so no. Uh, we have some partnerships for soft lending, right? But uh, in fact, uh, for uh, for an incubation totally online, well, we don't do that. We, we do have some what we call uh, non-resident companies. That's a kind of online uh, program, but it's not actually a online because. There's no a methodology of going online and you have classes or have time to be online and do uh, some 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 uh, uh, some uh, job inside the platform or something like that. So, but we do have some companies that are not in in our uh, in our uh, facility here at the campus of São Paulo. Yeah, that's the same with us, right? So it's not that it's an established online program, yeah. right? But uh, the company might choose not to be in-house, right? Being an in-house is, uh, is the, the way to, to enjoy the most the process of being in an incubator center. Uh, because system. you, you know that the, cafe, the coffee place is the place where you change ideas and you see people with the, the same kind of of problems and, and that it's very important to be inside a place like that even though you know the online world is getting bigger and bigger so we have to sometime, some, somehow accommodate these needs okay. next question good hi good morning i like something I, my question is for Jose, but I think he is important to know how to involve him. Uh, how works the application process for CETA? Okay. Well, our application pr uh, process is online. You just have to go to, through the website and there's a form. You can uh, apply your, your idea or your concept, or your, your company and uh, we have a team of experts that will make the uh, understand what what is your 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 proposal, and then we go through an interview, and then we can approve or not. Any time or any time. It's it's open all, all, all over the year. We don't work with batch like we, we used to do it on the past, but now is uh, open. Uh, uh, every, uh, all, all of the years. Uh, in our case, for the incubation program and also for the science part, we have a public call that is open all year, right? And also online, you send all of the documentation. 
but we analyze those generally twice a year, right? So uh, when it's close to uh, to our batch, what we call batch, right? We make a public uh, call. We disseminate that we're receiving those proposals, and then a group of experts uh, evaluate the proposals to see those who are most uh, uh, better fit to the the program. In Park, uh, with technology, well, technological park, we have two calls for per year. One of the first semester and in the second. It's online also. Okay, we have a microphone ahead. <laughs> uh, next question. Maybe also an additional question to the two questions before. So. Uh, the aim is to promote your own students to build startups. So the requirement would always be having a startup with at least one student included, meaning that, for example, startups which are now bad for the German people here would not be able to apply for by the incubator, uh, right? I guess that's, that's the case, right? No. <laughs> so, well, I don't know about the Sietaki, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, although uh, the incubator is from Unicamp, um, we have companies from all over Brazil. So you don't have to be a student or an alumni to enroll the incubation or incubation program or the science park. So we get people from all around. Yes, in, in our case it's the same. It's open for everyone. And uh, she mentioned the landing uh, the soft landing process of the cross incubation process. So uh, maybe a company, a startup from Germany, can make an agreement with our incubation communities. So you can uh, participate on both uh, uh, entities in, in German and in Brazil, maybe for accessing Brazilian market, for example. Yeah, perfect. It's the same up there. It's the same. Can, uh, anyone can apply for any country, any, any state of Brazil or outside. Next question, Thomas. Hi, uh, I apologize if I missed it, but uh, I didn't really see much in the way of what's the expected amount of funding or support that we can expect if we apply to one of these programs. Can you comment a bit on that? Do you have soft landing programs support? I don't know if you uh, I, I didn't quite understand if you're mentioning the ones that uh, are approved in our process, once approved. All right, something that is, uh, I guess, very common here in Brazil, most of the universities cannot invest in the companies that are incubated or in our spin-out companies. This is something that is quite new, as Professor Catalani explained a little bit. Right, so we do not invest in the companies. The incubation program is mostly uh, based on training. So we, we offer lots of training. And uh, Jose mentioned a little bit because we have lots of people who have this background on sciences and not on business. So I guess a greater part of our input is transforming scientists into entrepreneurs. And the other part is making the correct connections. So finding the investor or finding the good connections, right? Because we are in the middle of everything. So we'll know someone that will help you. So uh, I would say training and connections are the basis. Those connections with agents of the ecosystems or with, in with investors. In terms of funding, as Catalani showed in his presentation, we have here in Sao Paulo the FAPET. Oh. Uh, as you say, in, in, in the environment, we say found, uh, family, fund, uh, family, friends, and fools. 
Here we have family, friends, fools, and faqasas. It's the four F that are providing funding for a hard and science-based uh, company. And we helped uh, this company to access this fund. Not just FAPAS, but the others, the other one. Perfect. We, we have it also the, the same process. Uh, the startups, the entrepreneur have access for private uh, money or investment, <coughs> the venture capital group, and there are also FAPAS. Uh, our startups can access some kind of uh, PP1 as a program from, from FAPASB. Uh, you can access $300,000. Uh, $300, and PP2, the second uh, phase, you can access one million. It's uh, the base for, for growth. For, it's the base for you establish uh, your company, your startups. So time is over. So I want to invite you uh, for the coffee break. We have 20 minutes for that. So and then we will go on with the second panel. Okay, thank you very much for coming, Vanessa, Alessandro, thank and Luigi. So the second panel, uh, in the second, second panel, we will present you uh, some organizations uh, from the innovation system of Brazil uh, that are not linked to university or not uh, with uh, uh, regional reference. So these are uh, organizations with many, many uh, units Brazilian-wide, and they are uh, sectorial. We have, for example, uh, the first presentations will be from Embrapi and from Senai, uh, that means uh, industrial research. Then we have a presentation about uh, Embrapa. Embrapa is agricultural uh, research. And last, having, we have Fiocruz, this is more in the area of health science, um, health research. So uh, I wanted to invite, uh, we, we are delayed with the time, so we need to be more strong now. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so 10 minutes for Carlos Eduardo. Carlos Eduardo Pereira is the director of operations of Embrapi uh, and an old friend uh, from DID, uh, alumnus, uh, has, uh, so he is also full professor in automation engineering of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, he holds the doctor engineering degree at the University uh, of Stuttgart. Uh, and uh, and uh, he has, he had an, uh, the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Research Award as well from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. So uh, the career of Carlos Eduardo is very linked uh, to Germany. Uh, so, and you know our demands and has a very uh, key position at Embrapi. Uh, since eight years, you are from yeah. the beginning there, huh? No, no, six, seven years. Yeah. Okay, Carlos, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to put my timer there so they can control better the time. Okay, thanks, Marcel, for the invitation. Thank you all for here to share this short presentation about Embrapi. I had prepared for 20 minutes, now they mentioned 10. I'm going to skip some slides, but I can also talk fast. And if you have some questions, you can ask later on. As I wish, I um, did my PhD in Germany. I have good ties, and it's very nice to have these startups from Germany, and we see several opportunities for interacting with Brazilian startups and companies here. Just short to Embrapi. Uh, it's nice that we have at the very beginning, I was mentioned to Marcel, to have somebody talking good things about MRP. I think they didn't recognize me with the mask there and talking about, you're going to see the, the status that they have. They talk about 30 units. You're going to see we change a little bit in the time. But how to explain to Germans one slide what MRP is about? I assume that the Germans know what is Fraunhofer. And I would say that MRP can be linked to Fraunhofer. We are inspired by the Fraunhofer model to doing this interaction in academic industry. But they also AIF, I don't know if you're familiar with AIF. AIF is an organization in Germany that provides funding or coordinates some funding programs. 
And why we are like Fraunhofer? Because Applied Research Foundation of Organization, we partner with companies to transform original ideas into innovations that benefit society and strength economy. This is exactly the same we had in our webpage. <laughs> to say that's the goal of MRP, to put together industry and academic to do this. In AIF, the goal is to build alliance, putting together partners from industry, academic, to developing into products, products, or services in the market. And again, we are both. We have funding, that's a good news for you, and we also have a set of, we coordinate a network of MRAP units. Main goals, as I mentioned, like Fraunhofer, very important, we have to focus on business demands. That means we don't promote academic research. For that, there is FAPES, there is CNPQ, there is CAPES, other agencies. We focus on every project, MRP project must have at least one industrial partner. It's mandatory. This must include also MRP units. What we offer is a flexible, agile, and no bureaucratic way of doing this partnership. And we, funding from MRP is not to give a discount in the projects, really to share risks. Innovation means risk projects, both from time, in terms of technological as well as for the financial process, uh, part. And we're trying to do this uh, working together with industry. We are a private, not-for-profit organization. We're not part of the government, like IAF, but we have a contract with the government. And the contract has been renewed last year. Now, for the next 10 years, we have until 2030, we have a contract with four Brazilian ministries, the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovation. That's the main uh, coordinator of contract with Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Economy. And they provide funding for MRP to put into our project. Additionally, you have some funding for strategic programs like uh, for incentives law for informatics, like the IoT, Manufacturing 4.0, from Hood 2030, that's automotive for R&D mobility and logistics. We have partnership with Sebrae, it was mentioned before, that's for SMEs in Brazil. Sebrae helps also the SMEs to participate in Timbrapi projects, covering the costs, partially the costs of the SMEs and the startups. And you all recently have a partnership with BNDES, the developing bank, to work in areas like digital transformation, bioeconomy. I saw from the portfolio that we have, I think, for most of the entrepreneurs that we have here, we have some possibility to collaborate. We run a network of MRP units like the Fraunhofer Institute. The numbers increase a little bit. We have 76 right now. Uh, it's amazing to see that this during the pandemic, we've almost doubled the size. That's the reason why people are talking still about 30. It's not because they're not aware, because we really move fast. And we do have, all over in Brazil, several in Sao Paulo, already mentioned before, alone in the State University of Sao Paulo, USP, we have seven units. That means there's plenty of opportunities to, if you want, have the chance to know one of the MRAP units. I think this afternoon we're going to visit the IPT, right? IPT has two units there. One in the area of materials, another one in the area of bioprocesses. But we have in all different areas. And if you compare to Fraunhofer, it's nice because we have the same, right now we have exactly the same number of institutes, 76 and 76. One of the difference that Germany, this comparison to Brazil, continent Germany is a small piece here. It's not easy to coordinate everything, particularly the position that I have, have to travel a lot now back. In the pandemic, we're doing all uh, remotely, but now, and, but this is really an uh, interesting opportunity. Big advantage in the model that we use is that we have only, uh, the projects are directly managed between the industries and the R&D centers. We don't have project calls. That means you have really, you can do the speed that you need for the projects. Basically, two models. One, we provide one third of the project cost. The second one is particular for startups, you can provide up to 50% of the cost. That means if you don't pay the other 50%, companies and rapid units have to do that. And we could look into this uh, Death Valley. I move a little bit faster because we have five minutes now, but just say we, if you look in this TRL, the technology readiness level, we cover basically now almost all levels. We started with one, uh, three to six, that the Death Valley, for the startups who now have also support to seven to nine, and we even have a basic funding now that cover two here. That means basically we're offering possibilities in all areas. Some results in eighth year of operation, we bought 1,600 projects, more than 1,000 industrial partners, more than 2.15 billion reais invested from the industry, bringing almost to half of the funding, 
will be providing a bit less than one third. That's basically the model that we have. We have uh, different areas, we're going to have time to talk here, but we'd like to address international partnerships. Germany is here. We have Cornet and RISME as opportunities for startups. We can team together German and Brazilian startups so that if you meet during this week some interesting startups, we can together with them apply for funding, both from Germany and also from Brazil, and Rapid Cooperative Brazilian project. For instance, we have projects in this approved with 15 Brazilian and German SMEs working together, some large and mid-sized enterprise working with companies and with our different of our units there. I want to just talk briefly something that we have now that's very specific for a startup. That's what we call this lab to market model. That's a model for deep tech startups. And I saw that fits nicely what you have here. Um, skip there how to focus on deep startups big tech startups, but I, I think what's very important to mention, somebody told about that, this big advantage that startups have working with MBRP is not only the funding, is that we're going to be immersed on a unit that has a full equipment, people, researchers, and we also work with uh, CETEC. We have, for instance, an example here, we have some of our uh, success stories are people that were from uh, Incubate and CETEC, had a project with a Brazilian uh, MBRP unit at USP, then you can support now coming from the level three up to product commercialization. I'm not going to have time here, but we call this cycle one. You start a project doing the technology. Once the technology is qualified, you can go to product development part in cycle two. And when you finish the product use, we have an even cycle three. That's where MRAP is funding directly to the startups, provide some funding with matchmaking from investors. The idea is really go from the development up to the market. That's the, the, the idea here. Is a new program. This one was inspired by the Israeli model from the Israel Innovation Authority. That's based here, and no areas. We cover up to 50% non-refundable support. That means basically it's for covering people and uh, consumable costs, and they can develop. And then I think that can be also a good opportunity uh, within this context here. Some to finish some projects. As you can see here, a project with BAS. And Oros, this is a startup from south from Brazil doing agriculture disease monitoring. It was a very interesting project, now it's a product there. A project with using intelligence, artificial intelligence for intensive care units prediction. This K1 is a company from Minas Gerais that's being applied to the COVID pandemic very efficiently, very important. It could forecast the use of uh, the intensive care units and also the, the, the possible evolution from the, from the patients. Projects in the agribusiness areas, and that's bovine facial biometry. This is our unit, CPQD, and, and a small company here to do in there for being identified. The center is using image processing. Energy intelligence, I know there's some people from intelligence here. This is two here with our unit in, in Campina Grande, also machine learning for uh, how to improve in energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, then monitoring control, this is also a joint project from one small company up sensors and a, a energy provider company here then is monitoring those dams to avoid problems. Cosmetics here for our unit at the Institute of Physics from São Carlos at USP, two company working for optimization of skin problem analysis and new natural cosmetics tests. And blockchain, as we're going to have also Embrapa next. This is also a very strong topic that we have here using this case, using uh, blockchain concepts for doing traceability in the whole production. Industry 4.0 projects here, Anders Hauser, big company with a startup. As you can see, we have different models that you can use. And just to show that some project, we have several projects uh, successful developed already with startups. We'd be very glad to be able to do that. If you need more information, I could make the presentation available. I'll be around until noon, and then you can also uh, do some research on our web page. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. It was uh, very fast. Uh, you, uh, you can, um, I say, uh, work in horse uh, <laughs> rennen. Um, I, I know what is it is, so to, to, to need to speak fast. 
So uh, the next one is the presentation about industrial innovation overview from Senai Network Innovation Institutes. And our invited speaker is Carolina Andrade. Uh, Carolina is a director of the unit Senai Innovation Institute for Biotechnology. Uh, she has a uh, PhD at the Technical University Hamburg, 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 Hamburg in Germany, was, uh, ha had a, a scholarship from, from the AD as well, and, and what I show, so, so here, and have more than 10 years of experience in international management, operational management, project management, value creation, and critical evaluation of new technologies in the search for innovation. Very welcome. Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And uh, I guess that's uh, so a good opportunity. My task here is to talk a little bit about uh, our network from Institute. If you allow me, may I take out the mask? So, um, and uh, maybe the first concept that I should clarify to you is exactly what that means, Senai. If I could give you a good idea about the work that Senai is conducting here in Brazil, I would say that in some time we work like a Frau Hochschule in German, on one side, and the other side we are similar also to Fraunhofer. But when we started to, to conduct our R&D projects, look at, uh, at different countries to search a good model to follow, and uh, when I think of this concept, I would say that MIT act for us as a strategic partner related mostly to entrepreneurship aspects. And on the other hand, not surprisingly, Fraunhofer was the model that we adopted here in Brazil because Fraunhofer actually has a very similar model to work with companies as an intent to do. Um, when we are talk about our operational model. That means that uh, we are looking for, uh, we are intended to be an attractive institution for researchers as well for entrepreneurs. But also, we, we like when, when we tend to work uh, and uh, transversal and complementary for industry and uh, at last, but not at least, the final intention from Senai Network is to work as a bridge between academia and industry, because we are very good, very closely related to the industry, and we have almost a thousand different operational units spread in the, the entire country. And um, how can I show you about our network. Maybe Carlos has already explained you that uh, the difference of the size of countries, but we have uh, only, if I could say, 26 and our innovation institute in different areas from green chemistry to embedded system, biotechnology and IT. And uh, many of them are already MBRAP units. That means we are part of this network from MBRAP. It's a very large network. But we have also um, this accreditation units. That means we are, we are able to catch up money from systems like IANP, there is the money that comes direct from the oil industry or even from a CATI accredited unit. There are a special program for in the TY area. So um, <clears throat> to show you uh, some numbers from this network, we have uh, 
during the last 10 years, when we began our program, we have more than 1,300 projects already finished. More than 600 companies are served during this time, including small companies, medium companies, large companies, startups, in different uh, um, uh, sizes. And uh, we apported, and we, we have more than 1.2 billion reais uh, invested in all development from these projects. <coughs> to achieve these numbers, we have uh, a very qualified, high qualified uh, people work in our institutes, more than 900 researchers, most of them with master and doctor degrees. And, uh, and a high number also from dedicated professionals to support, because when we are talking about innovation, it's not only about conducting the R&D, but also to provide a system to accomplish the, the, the deliverable, to stay uh, in the costs, to stay in the pact that you have with the companies. And so we have an, a very a strong partner or a very strong stru structure to support this kind of development. <clears throat> Just to give an idea, we have here in Senai, São Paulo, also besides all the things in the network, an entrepreneurship program. And the, 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 the blue size, I would say that we have uh, uh, the phase one, two, and three more directed to open innovation. And so we are working with, um, if I could say, soft technologies. And the, the white part in the phase also middle, third, third, and four, we are working with more hard technologies. And so we, not, we don't incubate uh, companies or startups, but we try to accelerate them so they can uh, reach quickly the market. And so um, in these two models, the Codetech program, we um, accept companies or startups that have so a, a certain level of uh, maturity in the technology, and we apply and we, we give some funding direct from Senai, and so we can bust the company to, to leave, to deliver, in fact, the product until the market. The other possibility, when we are talking about more mature technology, and we are, the company is trying to, to scale up the technology, we use the system like Senai Innovation Institute, but also, and sometimes, the Senai Technology Institute, where we do have some uh, <coughs> pilot plants to scale up technologies, mostly technical or, um, for, instance, for instance, in the chemistry area or in the biotechnology area or even in the metal mechanic area. So just to give an idea, there is the brand new Senai Innovation Institute in bio, for Biotechnology. We are located here in São Paulo, in the neighborhood from Bom Retiro, about 8,000 square meters, with very good uh, um, infrastructure. And when we think about the technology that are complementary to uh, biotechnology, when you are think about innovation, you should think that there are some accessory technologies that should be uh, used really to achieve uh, something quite new. And so there is from biocat biocatalysis through bioremediation, nan nanotechnology, and we can divide that into very strong groups in deliverables. The first one would be the very large economy, bioeconomy market. So we are able to deliver something like uh, 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 fertilizers, biosensors, but even uh, new biogenic fuels like hydrogen produced through uh, uh, extremophiles, microorganisms. But on the other side, when you are looking at the health sector, we are also lay, use it to produce technology 
uh, for animal vaccines, but also for drug screening, for new antibiotica, and for new drugs. Just to thank you, because the time is over. And uh, there is a, we, we have, uh, so far, a very small group, but we intend to collaborate. And I wünsche euch eine sehr gute Aufenthalt in São Paulo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. So, and uh, our next presentation will be Embrapa Science and Innovation Driving Agriculture. And uh, the invited speaker is also uh, someone, Paolo, that have a stay, a research stay in Germany uh, for two years, three years, I don't know how long you, you were there in, at the Forschungszentrum Forschungs Jülich. Uh, so, uh, Paulo Hermann Jr., he is a senior researcher at Embrapa Instrumentation, one of the units of Embrapa. Uh, yes, I think uh, we go ahead. <laughs> you can... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. Thank you very much. Bom dia. Guten Morgen. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here today. It's, it's a wonderful. I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to give this talk. It's a very good opportunity. I will give a very brief information. It's about just 10 minutes. But I will talk about some things about in the research and how to include the innovation in this. Because Zimbrapa is a Brazilian corporation of the research, uh, Brazilian Agriculture Research Corporation. Yeah? And this is my idea. I think that is important to, to have our link here because I think that's very good to take a look there too. Very good information is in English and in Portuguese. Okay. And uh, this is the first slide just to give an idea that we are facing now. Food security is a very important issue. We are facing this now. When you look around, okay? And just to have some idea, to produce at least 50% of my more food by 2050, and the climate change could cut crop yields for more than 25 years, 25%. And in the year 2050, we have around 9.6 billion people Okay? And climate change. And we are looking at this now today with the fertilizers, Ukraine, and the pandemic, and the other things. Food security is a key issue. And we are concerned with the global goals, 2030. So there's a new complexity that we are looking at. Okay? Group, and in the, in the 17, uh, global goals, six, seven of them, we are ded directly dedicated to agribusiness. And we are concerned this, and with ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So all of the projects are to look in this direction. Okay? This is the Embrapa, okay? Uh, this is the national system of agriculture research. And the Embrapa is the coordinator of the national system. Okay? And we have the 17 state agents, research centers spread out to Brazil, and the federal network of professional education, and the Embrapa as well the private sector. Okay? And we have 40 six centers spread out to Brazil and our headquarters in Brasilia, okay? So we have around, this is, the Brapa was founded in 1973, okay? And you have around 86,600 6, employees and 2,350 researchers. Majority is PhD. So this is the scenario, this was Next year is around is 50 years anniversary, okay? 
And this is just an overview about the agribusiness in Brazil. I include this science, technology, and innovation driving Brazilian agriculture. When you look at this one, you have the, this figure here showing the area and the production. So, this increase a lot. Around the production is around 406%, and the area around 764. The productivity increase three times. So, what, how we can do this? Science. Science, technology, and innovation, and partnerships. Okay? So, this is a very interesting number. If we, if we didn't have this, we need around more than 156 million hectares. Okay? Just to have this production. And the agribusiness in Brazil is around 22% of GNP, labor 19.7%, and export 43%. It's a big issue in Brazil. About this is science, okay? This is the number of the publications during, since 1974. We have around today, 2021, 229, 1,513 publications in international, oh, okay. And this is the numbers of the patents. This is a partial number, but this show about the areas that we have a patents in chemistry, instruments, and instrumentation, agriculture, biotechnology, microbiology, and engineering. So, it's a spread out, the numbers of the since 2018, we changed the, the kinds of the projects. Now we have a project in the cost. Type 1, research and development. Type 2, development and validation. Type 3, open innovation. Okay, is it dedicated to the companies? Okay, this one here, social innovation, micro and small business, medium and large company, not classified. And this is the numbers of the project dedicated. So, since 2018, and all of the projects are related to TRL. I think that's very important. The previous presentation showed this one. Our concern is about deliveries, and deliveries has to be included in technology readiness level. All of the projects, see, that we want to. And startups, okay? For me, it was very interesting. Uh, oh, sorry. The conditions of extreme uncertainty. This is the definition that I think was very interesting. We are in facing very extremely uncertainty right now. And the startups, Okay. And Brazil and Germany in 2019 ranked third in the world numbers of Unicorp startups. Okay. And in the startups, we have the AG tax. Okay. In the AG tax, we have around, this was in two, the review, show the radar. Okay. And you have around 1,534 AG tax in Brazil, spread out to Brazil, okay? And this one was very interesting because the AG techs are working in the, before the farm, inside the farm, and after the farm. This is the numbers of the AG techs in this direction. Okay? This one gives some idea about where the AG techs are working. This was 2020. Okay, it's very early. And the Embrapa, is a, uh, they are a secretary of innovation and business dedicated to work in this direction, to open the innovation, to connect with the companies. And you have the partnerships with 100 startups. Okay, and this one show how uh, this interaction and the partnership innovation hubs 
So we don't have innovation hubs, but you have we can do the connections and the to work together. This one is about the some initiative, the acceleration programs that you have there, to innovation challenges. Okay, this one gives some idea. <laughs> and the lines of research develop innovation, support and funding. Okay. Brazilian law, I think the previous uh, uh, presentation gave this idea. And to finish, this one is the mega trends, the vision for the future of the Brazilian agriculture, and the mega trends that we are facing until 2015. And the sustainability, adaptation to climate change, Agro-digital, technological intensification and concentration of production, great, a rapid transformation in consumption in the aggregation of value, bio-revolution, integration of knowledge and technologies, and increasing the governments and the risks. So this is the final uh, transparency. A journal of the thousand miles begins with a single step. Really done. Thank you very much. Paulo, thank you very much for your presentation. So, our next uh, presentation, it's about uh, other area, research area. Uh, we will have here, uh, so, Renato Marins Domingos. Uh, Renato is business analyst at uh, Vio Cruz. Uh, Vio Cruz, uh, it's an institution uh, in the area of biotechnology, uh, health. Uh, they have a, a very large uh, area with, and it's in many states uh, from Brazil. Uh, Renato has been working for six years in the innovation along with the team of Innova program and technology platforms and also advisory of your cruise research vice president presidency and uh, we are very proud that uh, not only renato is coming uh, from fio cruz uh, so fio cruz uh, sent uh, also celeste and marcelo uh, the link to germany at fio cruz uh, so we are very proud to have not only one but three representatives from Frio Cruz today here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, it's a real challenge to present a, a huge institution as Frio Cruz, but I tried to summarize this in, in 10 minutes. So uh, I want to give you uh, an overview of, of our activities and what are our efforts for innovation in health. So uh, we are basically a R&D uh, institution that has more than 100 years of history. We main focus on research, education, production. We have also reference services, uh, scientific collection, health assistance, information and communication, and other uh, activities. So we are more than... Uh, well, 12,000, uh, we have more than 1,000 PhDs. We have a budget, an annual, annual budget, more than $1 billion. Oh, it's important to say that we are linked to the Ministry of Health. So uh, this budget came mostly of the Ministry of Health. Uh, we publish more than 1,000 uh, papers a year. Uh, we teach, we have an important uh, role in teaching. We teach more than 5,000 students. We are open for master degrees, uh, PhD degrees, and also technical education. Uh, we produce more than 110 billion of doses of vaccines, uh, pharmaceutical units. Uh, we are, for example, produce all the HIV uh, medicines in Brazil. We produced the malaria uh, medicines. We have more than 150 patents granted, not requested. If you think requested, we have more than this. We have about uh, 500. 
We are spread in 11 states in Brazil. Uh, it's important. Uh, it, we have an advantage because we have from the research uh, through the health assistance and going to the production. So we have almost all the development chain uh, of uh, biopharmaceutical or, pharma or pharmacist uh, products. And we also uh, work as a regulation with uh, quality control and uh, important information center. We are world worldwide uh, presence. Uh, most of them are collaboration with universities, uh, R&D centers, and also companies too. And uh, I can say that we have a, a BRICS. Uh, we are from BRICS and CPLP, which are a financial or and political organization uh, around the world. So it's important to say uh, our role in the, co the COVID-19 pandemic, we could uh, fight uh, and outbreak the pandemic with this main axis. We could give uh, diagnostic support, molecular testing production. We uh, were able to build a hospital, uh, uh, focus on, on COVID treatment, treatment. So we improve our healthcare. We invested a lot in research and production of medicines. Uh, I can highlight here uh, the clinical trial, uh, Solidarity, which was an uh, important uh, partnership with worldwide uh, organization, World Health Organization. Uh, we, we led this, this, uh, this clinical trial here. Uh, we invested in basic research and vaccine production. Uh, with information and communication, we uh, develop an uh, important dashboard, uh, which was a very uh, uh, instrument, a good instrument to monitor the evolution of the cases in Brazil of COVID, and it was a reference used by the press. Uh, we could give the population a lot of information, and uh, we have special investments for vulnerable population. We had uh, uh, special programs with society and we could uh, impact uh, vulnerable population as indigenous, as uh, uh, that work, uh, people from the shanties. And we could uh, reinforce uh, our role in education. So we trained professionals, we expanded our distance learning. Okay, this is a legacy from uh, COVID. We could build a, a biobank, which uh, storage samples, uh, human or not humor, for further research. This is our uh, amount of diagnosis uh, produced for uh, face the pandemic. We could deliver to, to health system more than 25,000. This is the, the amount of vaccines we could uh, deliver to the, our health, uh, our health uh, structure. Uh, we, it's, it was a really succeed uh, uh, technology transfer with Oxford and AstraZeneca. And it's important to say that we weren't the only one. We had uh, Instituto Butantan who, who also, who also uh, produced and created CoronaVac. And if you see uh, the picture, you can see uh, the effect of the, the impact of the, the vaccine. But we still have we'll, we still have challenges to face. That challenges are how can we deliver more innovative products and services to impact national health systems. So we have uh, four or five uh, actions. First, we think we have to invest. Then we have to support, and then we have to train. So. With this, uh, this base, you can uh, entrepreneurship, and then you have to create a department to link and to manage all these actions. The first one is our Innova program. It's, uh, it's a great uh, program that uh, has four uh, groups. The first one is the product development chain, which goes from the seed money, which is the idea, 
And the innovative projects, which is our, the, the third or the five TRL level, and you have le relevant knowledge, which is uh, basic research. Then we have a special calls from uh, health ministry, emergency, and vulnerable population. We have PhD, PhD scholarships, uh, and we have, uh, for example, local health problems, which we invest, for example, in malaria, Amazon. This is open for uh, uh, students from abroad, uh, but it's mandatory that you have uh, a partnership with a laboratory or a researcher from Fiocruz. Uh, we have a technology platform, which is important for you. If you have a problem in your research, we can deliver you a solution. We, have, uh, we provide services, you can hire us. Uh, we have, for example, nanotechnology platforms, we have genomic platform, we have protein engineer. So you outside can hire us to deliver a solution for your research. Uh, uh, we think that uh, changing mindset is an important thing because we, we are uh, more than 100 years institution, so we, ha we have the, uh, a lot of challenges to face about changing mind. So we created the Innova Labs, which is an on-the-job uh, training that takes 10 weeks, and uh, it's a way of uh, transforming the academic way of thinking into the business way of thinking. So we are constructing uh, the entrepreneurship program, uh, which is another eff effort to convert scientific knowledge into products for solving health problems based on ICT companies. The target is, if you have an idea, uh, idea a solution, or a technology, raise it inside Fiocruz, you can apply to the program, or if you have your technology from outside, you also can apply to. Uh, the range of technologies is from the hard science one to social and educational uh, technology. And how it works. First of all, we have a proposal. Then you have a pre-acceleration <laughs> stage, which you present and you will understand about the health market scenario in Brazil. Then you have internal offer which you offer your technology to our production units, so we accept or not. If you accept, you leave the program. So uh, if not, you go to the development stage, which you, your technology will be tested on the market. And then you have the three pathways. Exit, you can license your, or, or, spin, or creating a spin-off or a startup. And so for uh, manage all this, we have a not centered uh, way of, of managing. Uh, we understand that uh, the projects needed to be raised together with the innovation. That's why we have uh, uh, we call NITSI in, in each branch of Fiocruz, and it's responsible for intellectual, intellectual property, technology transfer, uh, prospecting, and manage our technological portfolio of Fiocruz. So that's it. I rushed a little bit, but <laughs> I could. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Renato. You can take place. I want to invite Carlos and uh, Paulo uh, to join us here at stage. So I will, we will have uh, 10 minutes uh, for questions and, and answers. Uh, Carolina, sorry. You are four, not, not three. Yes, you can sit there. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, who wants to, to start uh, with the first question? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lucas. I have a question for Renato. Uh, actually, it's two questions. Uh, the first one is about the biobank you have. Uh, you have samples from uh, how, uh, from how much diseases from malaria, COVID, and uh, and how many others do you have? Yeah, uh, first we have most of them uh, uh, the COVID one, but uh, we have we are trying to uh, to gather all the the biobanks that we have. This is the one centered. And we are making an effort to, to, to gather all the biobanks that we have in all units to uh, be in one place. So we, we, we will be, we will have uh, malaria, tuberculosis. We still have, but it's 
located in each unit, but we will still have this, uh, these samples too. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, if a startup works in collaboration with your crews through these programs that you... Uh, uh, is, is it possible that this startup uh, get access to the samples in the biobank to develop uh, uh, projects? With it? Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how to answer this because we have uh, some rich, uh, law constraints about access the genomic, uh, the genomic, uh, how can I say, the genomic samples, the genomic way you have a patrimonio genético. I don't know the, how to say that. Uh, so uh, I think you have to to sign an agreement. Uh, uh, I have to. Uh, I think you have to. Uh, put your uh, research uh, through uh, a, a, a prov approval from uh, the the Ministry of uh, uh, a lot of ministries, uh, the the ethical committees. But I think it's not impossible. I think it's it's completely possible too. But there is a a, a, a path uh, that you have to to go. Uh, with time and with agreements. Okay, thank you very much. But if you want to talk a little further, we can, we can talk more. Oh, sure, uh, I would, I'd like that. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Rafael. I have two questions. Two questions, two, one for Embrapi and one from, for uh, Fiocruz. Fiocruz, first, you said about the proposals. Is it the proposals related to equity, or I, I didn't understand better? It's like you, it's a proposal for the government, but it, we will be some projects be funded, and then this funded will be equity related. And the question to MRP is like the same because you said the cost about to 50 percent, and this fund this fund is equity related too. Okay. Yeah. When you go, when you enter in the entrepreneurship, uh, it's uh, you can be a proposal, or a project, or technology. Uh, we, it's mostly a training, uh, a training uh, program, but we can give you some structure for developing your research. Uh, you can, from outside, you can use our technology share. Our uh, labs, uh, you can give access to our uh, structure. Yeah, in our, in our case, we don't ask any equity. Is the idea is uh, like I showed the three phase cycle one, two, and three. If you go to cycle three, that you go to the market, then you can get apply for this grant. I would say that would be this amount of money. In three or five years, there is a time that is defined. If you're successful then you should return back this funding that we can use for other startups. If you fail, that was a grant. It's really the same model that is used in Israel with success, but we're not asking any equity. The, the expectation that you grow and can become a unicorn and hire people and generate and pay tax and so on, that's move the whole economic system, not that we are asking them. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Chita. I'm, I'm from University of Stuttgart. So my question is to Professor Carlos. At which stage one can approach you for the collaboration of their startup? Yeah, definitely, yes. But there are two ways. One is it's a very decentralized model. That means if you have, during the week, we meet some MEMBRAP units, we don't have to talk to us to get the project approved. The units have already some budget, and they know that they have to contract projects with the industry, including the startup that can do. And they're basically using our IT system to inform us about that. But of course, you have 76 units, eventually you go, oh, which one should approach? I'm visiting Sao Paulo, have a lot in Brazil. We can help with that. We have also, we can just send an email, identify you that can provide, put you in contact with some of the units that can help you then. Thank you very much. Carolina, 
Uh, so, uh, are, are the Senai Institutes of Innovation open as well for demands uh, from the German startups, for the German entrepreneurs? Yeah, for sure. How it we, works? We, we have uh, so a large uh, <coughs> experience to build up and to construct this kind of a relationship. For instance, as uh, it, uh, Carlos mentioned before, using Cornet. Uh, funding possibility, and so the coordinator will would pay for startups in German, and then this Brazilian side could be Embrapi, or could be FAPESP, or could be FINEPI. We can be able, and we are able, to look for funding here in Brazil to cooperate very actively with uh, German startups. Thank you. Maybe the same question to Embrapa. Paulo, could you repeat again? If Embrapa, uh, so how can uh, the, the young entrepreneurs from Germany uh, work together to Embrapa? Ah, okay. Yeah, that, oh, yes. This is the one good possibility because uh, it's about to work together with the Germans. We have students, we have uh, postdocs, and uh, we can do this. We can organize, for example, some possibilities to innovators, to startups. Okay? And with the Germans, yeah. This is one possibility to look at this option too. Yeah? Thank you, Paulo. Next, Sören. Yeah, in this uh, same approach, and do you have any structured approach to this? So are you, uh, um, do you have a soft landing hub or something for international uh, startups where this is for all four of you? Do you have any program in place where you can easily access or, or where you have like, we heard about Global Deep Tech, we heard about uh, other fields like Agritech. Are they mostly um, for the internal domestic market or are you looking for international markets as well and are you trying to hire or are you trying to connect international startups with your own startups? Do you have any programs for that in place, or is this mostly like peer-to-peer -peer based? Uh, we have the project that we are, I was in Germany, it's called LABES, the Scientific Cooperation. Just to look at this option, this opportunity, okay, to have this cooperation about the innovators too. It's science and technology. So there are some possibilities in this direction. Not just about uh, PhD or postdoc, but the ends of the problem that we can solve, we can do together. Okay? This is the basic question that I can answer. Yeah, just to, to, to add, I, I think one point is important to mention here is, is we're not talking about one or another here. We can really combine, as Carolina mentioned, we have Senai Institute that are past on Embrapia and so on. And as I mentioned, in our case, we partner a lot with, uh, let's again take the use of SATEC, for instance, if we have just mentioned about the soft landing and so on that they offer, for instance, we have uh, Ezauk is one of our units in the agro business area. They have a par technological park there. That means it's totally possible that you come, buy soft landing, go to this and use the improper funding because you are partnering with one of the improper units to do a project. That's also possible. So I want to thank you all, uh, so the time is over, uh, so it was very interesting presentations and, and now uh, the discussions, but we need to go to, to the next uh, topic of our agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, the next topic is the Germany-Brazil intercultural training for business. Uh, uh, and uh, the speaker will be uh, Sven Dinklage. Uh, Sven, uh, he is uh, the representative, the liaison officer of the University of Potsdam in Brazil and founder of the Flexpert Training uh, Company and is in this role from the Flexpert Training that he is today here with us. Uh, I have here to inform that this training will not uh, be located in this room, but uh, in the, on, on the fourth floor. We need to go now uh, to the fourth floor. So, welcome to 
to the cross-cultural session. My name is Sven, you see it here on the screen, and also I, I wrote it down here. Let's start because I think we only have, from what, uh, we had a little more, now we have 45 minutes or so, so this is just to give you a taste uh, on intercultural communication and cooperation. As I said, my name is Sven, and I'm the owner of Flickware Training, and also I am the representative at, uh, in Brazil for Uni Potsdam, and we are part of TBH, of the Centro Centro Alemão de Ciência e Inovação in São Paulo. So I have these two hats on, and uh, really nice to be here to talk to you, with you about uh, intercultural challenges. So first of all, maybe I would like to know. But first of all, who who knows the golden rule of mankind? Have you heard about that before? What? The golden rule of mankind. <laughs> Any idea? Somebody said yes? No? no? To love the other as we love ourselves. Yeah, that's close. Yeah, that's, well, that's one uh, way to say it. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You could also say to treat others the way you would like to be treated. And they say that in all religions, all or written documents of religion, there's something like that. Or don't do to others what you don't, what you wouldn't like to be done to yourself. Now that's a nice rule, we say. Treat others like the way you would like to be treated, but actually, and I could maybe write this here, there's a better rule, which we tend to call the Platinum rule. Platinum, which is, I guess, more, Worth more than the, than gold. Treat others the way they would like to be treated, and not the way I would like to be treated. So the way, because and you know this from the family probably, the way I would, I like things is not always the way others like uh, things done to them. So the platinum rule is something uh, when you talk interculturally, much more. Interesting, but makes much more sense. The golden rule is really nice, but the platinum rule is also uh, even maybe even better, especially when you work internationally. So uh, that's what we're here for to discuss the subject a little bit because, uh, and we don't do that a lot because we tend to assume that all people are the same, but we're not. And you know this a little bit, but if you live in Brazil, you, you are in your Brazilian water, you don't notice some things you do. Yeah, so we could demonstrate, and if we have time, we demonstrate a Brazilian hug and a German hug, for example, or a kiss or a handshake. There are some differences, and we don't notice that when we live in our own country, so, or in our own culture. So here we are to discuss this a little bit and to make things so you can cooperate better with each other, and so you have a feeling and feeling of what I might do is maybe not the way, or can maybe interpret it in a way that I'm not used, uh, that I'm not used to, or that I didn't intend to be interpret interpreted that way. So yeah, maybe before I present myself real quick, who is um, first time in Brazil? Okay, so I know I already know who is not Brazilian. Yeah, is that true? Who, of those that are not Germans, who uh, has already been to, to Germany? Okay, so we have a few also. Yeah, but, uh, but we have Brazilian innovators. Okay, where are the Brazilian innovators? Okay, so most of you have not been to Germany yet. Is that correct? Okay, but you will really soon. And then we also have some other nationalities here, maybe? Non-Germans or non-Brazilians? What's your nationality? I'm American. American? India. India, okay. Anyone else? Costa no? Rica. Costa Rica, yeah. Christian, yes. Another second passport. Okay. Um, good, what else? Uh, I prepared some, some questions here. What I want to do, oh, yeah. So, um, have you had intercultural trouble before? Let's say. So, have you had really some misunderstandings or so? We don't have to talk about this in open, but you know, we, there are, we invest in this time also because this is uh, 
this can mean great losses if you don't do this well. So if you talk wrongly to, the wrong, to an agency in the wrong way, or to a certain professor, this may have certain consequences that you would not like. So, yeah, so real quick, uh, so this is what I also do, so I build bridges, let's say, and uh, I work, when I'm not active for only Potsdam, I work with leadership trainings, cross-cultural like this, with expats, with uh, uh, expatriates, and also with, with coaching, here's some impressions, and uh, I also, I wrote a book about this, this is only in Portuguese, uh, uh, different cultures, different uh, customs, which is exactly what I was talking about, we can, if you want to have a look later on, I also have a few additional copies. I would like to leave one uh, with Marcio also for, for DVH, and maybe we can leave one at, at uh, Inova also, um, which talks about how to receive foreign visitors, because foreign visitors may not like exactly what you like, so that's... I, we have some more literature to look at, and I also brought some, some other books that I always recommend to you, so we can maybe talk about that real quick. I think before, well, this is the, the whole thing, I think. Um, we, I like to use this bucket to say we are, you want to fill this bucket with something positive so people will trust you, vice versa. So what do I do to make this fuller? And what do I have to avoid so I don't empty the bucket? I think this is the main idea when you talk interculturally. What do I need to do in Brazil? So I get trust. Uh, for example, you would have to smile, which is a little difficult with a mask on. Yeah. If you want to, I won't say that in Germany you don't have to smile, but it's not as important as it is in Brazil to smile. Yeah. So that's one one example. If you come late to a meeting with a German, especially, you will lose trust and it will go out the out of the bucket. And then one other question is. How full do you start with, with somebody you don't know? I would risk to say that in Brazil, the green arrow is much more important because uh, we start with a low level of trust. I've also heard that uh, they, talk, they say that in Germany too, but I would say ten, uh, the trend is that you, that you start with more trust uh, if you don't know somebody. Yeah? So that's also so. This is also the, the always a concern. What do I have to be careful about? And it's not about to do's and to don'ts. And we only we don't want to talk about stereotypes either. So maybe I I have to add here a disclaimer because I'm going to generalize sometimes. So uh, we talk about trends, okay? And I know Germany. Well, we all change. Culture changes all the time. So we also have to be really careful that we talk about trends and not a stereotype and say all Germans do this, all Americans do that, all Indians do that, all Brazilians do this or that. So that's also uh, important because it's not that easy to talk about this issue, it's much more complex. And we have cultural differences of course in our own countries, regionally, etc. I would like you, and please, if you have a question, raise your arm, if you have uh, something to add. I would like you to stand up if you want to participate. We do have some rules here to distribute. So maybe if you take one and then pass it on to your neighbor. And I hope we have alcohol somewhere so we can uh, get our hands clean. But um, the, the invitation is that you take one roll and pass it on to your neighbor. It's a behavior. And you please, if you could get up and walk around. Pretend you're in a cocktail party. If you are in the, in the, in the more expensive seats, uh, want to participate, go, go ahead. <laughs> and please, switch, choose a. Actually, you're, you're showing shoes, so you just you get one. Just take one. Get it later. I know you take one. I pass the rest of Yeah, there's a language issue, so Portuguese and English, so two different languages.
German, so you also have that influence, and uh, you have regional differences, as you said, Cologne and the Carnival City. Now, there's still, uh, there's still, as I said, stereotypes is not what we want. What we want, so you have to be, be careful. But sometimes uh, you can look out for certain behaviors or certain trends that may happen. That's, that's <coughs> and that's what also what, and let's see what you what you're going to say about the fruits I bring here. So. Tell me which fruit or which which fruit has more to do with your cultural heritage, with your upbringing. You have a, you're raising your hand. Coconut. <laughs> the coconut. Yeah. What do you associate with the coconut? Uh, because this is like a fruit from my hometown, oh, man. and almost every day we are having this. Oh, we are having this. Okay. So every so every lunch or. Uh huh. All right. So that's a good. Going long, but not. A good, a good memory, yeah. All right. What? Well, anybody else? Yes. Uh, it could be other than than than, than this two. Sorry. It could be other fruit than this two. Yeah. What other fruit do you have in mind? Jabuticaba. 
Jumping Chicago? 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 Jumping Chicago?
uh, you know, what you, you see only the behavior. So we saw those stereotypes or these behaviors that you just used, but you also see the appearance, what people look like, what are they dressed, the food, the stuff you see immediately. But then there's a lot that that you don't see, but that you should know in order to understand what's up here. Okay, so normally, and this is one of the images that we use, you could use a tree and you have the roots, okay, instead of under the water here. Also, an iceberg is actually already an image that is not so easily associable with, uh, for all of us. I mean, who has ever seen an iceberg uh, in real life? Okay, we do have a few in Costa Rica that have some, of course. <laughs> 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 But we have both seen Titanic and the stories of the iceberg is okay. Um, and here, if you take uh, this, uh, so you have a lot of things here history, geography, um, you have the, the past, um, the climate. Yeah, you have some uh, examples here that down below that have influenced what happened here. And here, I think we have a few examples about, about the Germans because this is uh, the moment where when we used this, we were talking about the climate. So in Germany, in a colder climate, you tend to behave differently than in a hotter climate, or independent of your, of your nationality, the climate and the, where you are in the globe is, makes a difference. It also makes a difference with uh, resources, maybe, you know, where you are on the globe and how you manage your resources. Yeah, so this is uh, the case for some countries like Japan, like some European countries, some other countries who have little resources and have to manage them somehow, very different from Brazil, which has a lot of resources and manage, manages them in a different way. Conflicts, you know, past wars, for example. You have immigration, of course, which is also interesting in, in if you compare Europe with Brazil today, I can say a few words about that. And religion is also always a cultural component that is quite important on what you believe in. And I think we're going to see now some cultural dimensions where, where this theory uh, explains that if you have a strong God, you tend to outsource some of your, or you tend to influence your life a little less than if you don't have a strong faith in something. Really summarizing. Now we can discuss this better. But immigration is interesting because Brazil tends to see itself as a multicultural country where people, and you see it in the, in the faces of people, where people are very much mixed between the three people that lived here before, or that, no, where you have the, the natives, and you have the Europeans, and the, the, the black, the Africans that are coming. So there's, we all mix uh, through these three races, let's say, or through these different uh, influences. The problem is that, or the problem not, the interesting thing in Brazil is that it stopped 100 years ago, more or less. So the, it is very multicultural through, in the blood, but not so multicultural in behavior because we had 100 years to become real Brazilians and uh, have the Brasilidade really, really strong with some, some, yeah, some things we can maybe list if we have the time. I think we have only 10 minutes left for that more or less. So that's uh, the thing about immigrant whereas in, in Germany you have this old stereotype of the blonde Germans, which is of course not true anymore uh, either. And you have now the Germans becoming much more uh, multicultural over the last 60 years, let's say 50 years. A little, very different from Brazilian movement, if you want. In Germany, we have, I think, about 15, 30, 40 percent of people who were born in a different country. In Brazil, it's 1 percent. So the, that's also why it's much more comfortable being a foreigner, depending on your region in Brazil than in Europe, because you're much more welcome, let's say, oh, you're from somewhere, where are you from? And, uh, not always with good associations also with Germany, but in general, that's interesting. And, de and, and decentralization has to do with power, so Brazil is very centralized, 
whereas some other countries are very decentralized. Germany, I would also say, where you have then uh, less power concentration and that has an influence on hierarchy and on status and on cultural differences. Now, on uh, differences in society, which is a big thing in Brazil. So just one example here about, uh, you know, if you come from Germany and you see the stop sign, as my father always said, we have that here in Brazil too. It says, Pare, you know, you stop. But my father always said, yeah, but uh, they don't stop. Huh? Because we have a different interpretation about uh, the same sign, which is what happens uh, interculturally all the time, of course. And then the Germans, they will have, you know, you're being an example for, for children, so you only, you know, you only walk across the street if it's, it doesn't matter if there's traffic or not, and that's something Brazilians always find very strange in Germany, where people obey the traffic light even in the, on a Sunday morning. Yeah, so if we had time, we could talk a little bit more about this, and don't, don't forget, I have these little cards which are for your pocket on how to understand Brazilians and Germans. We have five minutes, so I think I have to move on. Um, so the iceberg, yeah, the question is, you know, what do you, what we, what we could do is to ex assemble a list of, you know, what is probably a good idea, what is maybe, uh, what you have to be careful about, but this is going to be on the, on the cards that I'm going to give you. There yeah, is some theory, so uh, we mentioned some of, so the, the, the writers, the literature, has defined different cross-cultural dimensions, which show up here. So for example, Brazilians tend to be much more high context, so they don't tell you straight out what they, what, what, uh, what they want to say, but they talk about other things and, uh, between the lines, so the context is higher than uh, in other countries. The limitation thing is about religion, amongst other things, where you say, that's my destiny, I couldn't do anything. So there's some countries who are much more in control, like the Americans, who say, yes, we can, and so on. Yeah, they believe that uh, even though they are strong Protestants, but they also, well, part of being Protestant is to have things under your control. So that's also an interesting point. And there are different uh, dimensions which we don't have too much time to go into now, but uh, individualism, collectivism, of course, it talks for itself. Polychronism, so people doing things at the, very, at the same time, whereas the Germans and men in general, and the older people maybe who do one thing at a time, yeah, whereas uh, other people are good at doing several things at the same time. But a German, this is for the Brazilians, a Brazilian, a German will always say, but it doesn't work. You, it only works if you do one thing at the, at the same time. At least that's the stereotype uh, from back from the past, maybe. And then hierarchy, we talked about it. So Brazil really hierarchical. That's something you have to keep in mind if you talk to a professor from the university. That's a very important person. Yes, thank you. Um, and then there's one thing about universal particularism. So all rules apply to the same, to, to all people. And sometimes uh, in Brazil they say, uh, actually it comes from France, I think, for for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. Mm -hmm. So this can sometimes be complicated. And also uh, risk uncertainty is another dimension where I think both Brazilians and Germans, at least, in general, they are not very risk comfortable, not very comfortable with risk. Uh, so this is something also to keep in mind. Even though Brazilians, they have to they have to find, figure something out to survive, right? Uh, so they uh, are creative in that sense, yes. And then, of course, you have class and relationship orientation where Brazilians tend to be. In Brazil, we say it's not re business relations, but it's relation business. So first, you have to a relationship, and then you talk about the task at hand. At least that's the, the indication. So I. I have to unfortunately skip this. We can maybe just real quick uh, take here the temperature as a finish to finish the, our meeting. So you are driving, I can maybe explain this. Basically you are driving next to your best friend who runs over a passenger. No, who runs over a pedestrian on the street. 
he or she is over the limit and uh, you know, hospital and uh, the judge and you're in front of the judge and he asks me, who was a passenger, did he or she drive too fast? And the question is, what do you do? Uh, or what right does your friend have to expect that you're going to lie for him? Yeah, because I'm going to say, no judge, uh, I swear by, you know, by God that I'm telling the truth. No, he was only, or she was only by 30 or 50 as the, the, uh, the police uh, found out. That's the question. Um, if you're from a particular risk country, people will ask what? Happens a lot in no, not so much. We, we're going to see a scale here, but sometimes it happens that people say, mm, it depends. What happened to the pedestrian? And that is, of course, a particularist approach. Yeah? Because if you're a universalist, it doesn't matter. You have to tell the truth. And these are some country numbers here, um, which I'm going to leave you with. You see here that according to this, uh, this is one of the uh, writers, uh, Trumpeners and Hampton Turner. So Germany is not so universalist either, at least on their scale here. This is also not very fresh data, um, and Brazil is somewhere around here. So please, uh, yeah, my time, our time has uh, come to an end. I have one card that's just real quick, and I'm here for questions if you want to. So if you are a foreigner, if you're not Brazilian, I have this uh, green card with the Brazilian map. I only have a few for those uh, who need to understand Brazil a little more, then please take one. This is in English. If you are para quem é português brasileiro ou sabe ler português, é sobre os alemães. This is the one about the Germans. One last question, and thank you for for now. Any comments? Wow, is it, is it, are we over one already? Quick? Yeah? What time is it? 12.52? Okay, so we worked only much quicker. So question? Anyone a comment? Uh, I probably, you know, so what do I do now? Yeah, so this may be a question, so if you have a specific question on what to do now, this is the time, or you can catch me later. No? I will also circulate. Two more, three more books, yeah, while we speak. So this is one book about the German, Brazilian living in Germany, and the other one is about uh, how to understand the Cariocas, people from you. <laughs> German, English, uh, no, German, English, and Portuguese. Yes, who had a question? Oh, you, you. Please, the ladies first. <laughs> I never imagined that Brazilians are more hierarchical than Germans. Like I thought, because like at least in my college, some students call the professors just by their first names, and I saw that in some other countries, maybe U.S., they say like Mr. Smith or something. So I was kind of impressed by this, or like no complex. It was another surprise for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think hierarchy, this is also uh, so fascinating about the subject because it's not, it's, it's sometimes controversial. So uh, I think also hierarchy is a big thing in Germany. Um, the, the formality with the Z and the Du, for example, right? So there you have more informality in Brazil, which doesn't mean that it's not hierarchical. And in Germany, you maybe you have it more in the organizations and not so much in society. In Brazil, there's a strong hierarchy in society, which sometimes translates into the organizations. Where we're all, we're all friends, but uh, it's still very, very, the decision is made uh, at the very top. And well, in some countries, maybe that's a little more divided and a little more, yeah, everybody has a word. So. More horizontal. Yes, yeah, more equal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks. How we tell to be a problem to write in the different cultures? Because here in Brazil, uh, the way we use the, the, the word love is different from the other countries. And then we, when we say, oh, I love this or I love that, it, it is not the, uh, the high sentiment of love that's, whoa, no, it could be something, whoa. 
I like it. It's uh, something more simpler, and this could be a really problem for the for the coaches, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about another word that has a very different meaning. But love is something like the Americans. They are very. You say it all the time. I, at least that's my that's my feeling. For a German to say liebe dich, that's a big thing, and we don't use that uh, very often. So in, in, in Brazil also, the other word is amigo, you know, which means the same thing as friend or as friend, but it has a different meaning. You say amigo to a people you met uh, half an hour. So uh, uh, and another word, if you allow me, I'm filming, is uh, the Ger the Brazilian word for chance. You know, shit. Ah. No? No? Which is something that we use very easily in English, very easily in uh, German, but in Brazil it's a big, it's a big thing. So that's uh, language. So you have to be careful how you translate things because it's not always the same meaning, even though it's the same word. So you can personalize your message the best possible way. And, and there are some taboos we haven't talked about, but you cannot that you I don't know that you that you have to be careful about. That maybe may not be a good message. And of course, that's generally you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about certain things, about religion, for example. But there may also be some other taboos. You know, the Amazon is a very sensitive subject at the very moment, so that you have to be careful about. Sorry, it's just a superficial answer. Okay. Well, thank you. Good luck. And if I can be of any help, let me know. Don't forget to take a card here. And good luck on your presence. Okay.